All right, so let's uh, get started. Hopefully, uh, all of you are at least a little bit familiar with the ISO 27001 standard, or at least you're at least interested in it. That would also help. Um, so I will go through uh, some of the basic uh, ingredients to the standard, but also then how it can help you getting support or buy-in. Buy-in is really similar to to support, uh, you know, for that uh, for for the information security management system that you may be implementing there. And cybersecurity are not the same. And cybersecurity is often confused with, oh, anything to do with, you know, if there's any risk to your systems and if data could be compromised. And well, to a certain degree, that's true. But the actual uh, definition is a little bit different. So basically, cybersecurity is the ability to defend or protect the use of cyberspace from cyber attacks. And what are cyber attacks? They're the things that actually hang off the internet. So anything that's connected to your networks. Now that's important because information security is a much broader context. And that, that concept of information security is also included cyber security, but it also has things like how people are dealing with printed information, uh, where do they go around with uh, movable media, for example, uh, USB sticks, thumb drives. Uh, it could be your hiring and firing policies in your business. Uh, all of that links to it. Disaster recovery, you know, all of those uh, concepts, and especially the CIA triangle, confidentiality, integrity, and availability triangle. And that's what the ISO 27001 talks a lot about, those three concepts. Now, when we're talking about cybersecurity, we're typically dealing with anything to do with confidentiality, where data is stolen or it's compromised and then put out there in the public domain where people can see that sensitive data. So that's a confidentiality issue. It can also be an integrity issue if your data is stolen by hackers and then it's manipulated. For example, they've taken over your website and they have now put incorrect information that actually uh, puts you in a, in a bad uh, light. And they've they've edited your actual your your corporate website, for example. That could be an, an example of an integrity issue. But it can also be that they've hacked into your finance system, uh, stole some data, which is confidentiality related, and also have then manipulated your records so it's now completely incorrect and you're in a big strife. And that becomes then an operational issue, and you might need a business continuity plan to then to deal with that. Availability is more about disaster recovery pro uh, processes and having those in place. So the unavailability of data uh, could be due to a cyber attack or other forms. Um, that means that, hey, now actually our data cannot be accessed by the right people. And um, that could mean, for example, uh, ransomware, which is uh, affecting, in, in some uh, examples, ransomware uh, could affect your ability to get access to your data, or uh, it could uh, actually compromise your, your network connectivity. And that means your availability of your systems is now actually uh, affected. So that's the three concepts that we often deal with in information security management systems. So hopefully you guys all understand that because often when we talk about it with colleagues and just generally what we see in the media, uh, it tends to cover mostly, it's talking, uh, if there's a data breach, for example, it talks more mostly about confidentiality. But integrity and availability are also very important concepts, and they're included in the framework of ISO 27001. So information security also deals with digital, analog, uh, non-cybersecurity risks, like it says there, uh, handle, handling uh, employee vetting processes, data governance, non-networked or standalone systems. They still exist, and yeah, it's important to see that it's not all cyber security related. We need processes for other forms of security when it comes to handling information. So what you see here is a picture where you see the prevent and prepare as well as the respond and recover stages. Prevent and prepare pretty much being the beforehand, before an incident, and then responding and recovery, meaning when it's happening. So um, when you talk about uh, cyber incident response planning or CERP, some of you may have that, or cyber security incident response planning, the CSIRP, the cyber incident response plan, that's when we're talking about the response and recovery and specifically for cybersecurity events because it's cyber incident response plan, right? Then if we go a little bit broader, that means, for example, that we're dealing with cybersecurity management. And that includes 
in the ISO 27032 standard, for example, it includes your prevent and prepare phase. So it actually covers prevention, preparation, response, and recovery in that framework. Then some examples of, well, a particular example that you, you're probably quite familiar with if you work in information security, the NIST 861 or other frameworks that deal with computer security incident handling. That's when there's an incident and we have to deal with it. And it could be any incident. It doesn't have to be cyber. It can also be broader. If that's the case, um, that framework then co covers the response and recovery phase, as you can see in this picture. And then lastly, the whole framework of ISO 27001, for example, there's more of them, but like let's say the ISO 27001, it covers prevention, preparedness, response, recovery, and it does that for not just cyber events, but also for the broader scheme of in, uh, information security. So it includes all of those aspects, including all the controls that it has, and also some, uh, yeah, some methods, other other clauses that deal with your general uh, overall maintenance of the process. So that's hopefully giving you some guidance on how it all hangs together. Now, another thing to mention here before we get into more the ISO 27001 scope of what's included there and how it can help you uh, get traction with people around you is cyber attacks happen to the best. And we always think, oh, we can uh, prevent everything, especially security people generally have uh, the the uh, the goal, the aim, the objective, I was going to say the illusion, but let's keep it nice here, um, but the objective to reduce any likelihood, basically. If there's also the, even the slightest chance something would happen, they would like to mitigate that. And um, yeah, the risk-based approach actually says what would be the impact. And if the impact is medium, moderate to low, you might choose not to treat that cybersecurity risk or that information security risk. And that's where security people are sometimes struggling a lot because they want to really prevent. And with cybersecurity and information security generally, it's become pretty much impossible to set yourself that, uh, that goal. We often talk about uh, it's a matter of when it happens, not if it happens when it comes to information security uh, uh, threats. So these are some examples of organizations that we put all our faith in, right? So we pay hefty fees for external vendors of cybersecurity uh, tools and, and software uh, and monitoring systems. For for example, FireEye, uh, they actually are the, the bee's knees, you know, the real uh, high-end kind of really specialized uh, firms that do this for other organizations that protect systems and, and you know, do that for, for a whole range of different organizations and industries globally. And yeah, they could also be subject to being hacked. And that's, of course, when we get really nervous thinking, well, if they can't uh, protect themselves, how can they protect us? And who can? Because there's not that many options out there. And so um, another uh, couple of examples here cybersecurity executives weighing in on vaccine data hacks. So this is where the health sector gets affected by hacking, by breaches, and that's where we all get really nervous, including boards, including all the staff in your organization, because this becomes a human impact of a hack, and not just a, ah, oh, some financial uh, details. That's also human, but when it becomes human health and well-being, we get uh, really, really nervous, of course. All right, here you can see um, some government data being up for sale. Uh, it's a pretty common uh, thing that we're reading almost on a daily basis now. We see that governments uh, are also really investing in this. But if corporates are really investing in this and have budgets available, typically government has to be making even more choices on where they're going to put the fairly limited budget sometimes that they have for this. And so they're literally... Uh, typically, you know, a little bit behind the facts as well. And even corporates are behind the facts, even the big corporates, because uh, what we find is the hackers, you know, the, the cyber criminals, the information security uh, breach experts, uh, the hackers for, not for good, but the, uh, the bad ones, they typically have much bigger budgets than any of the corporates and the governments that are out there to hire the right people with the right skills. So um, that's where the challenge has really uh, come in. Uh, I still have the faith, by the way, that people are really consciously making the choice also not to go that way, uh, just like uh, any uh, house can be broken into by someone, but I still have the faith that not everybody will break into other people's houses and that we still have uh, good 
people with good values around, right? So in the cyber world, it's very similar, that dilemma. The only difference is with cyber, uh, it tends to be uh, a lot easier for people who do the bad thing to hide and to not be be ever visible to anybody. Whereas uh, someone breaking into your house would be probably more at risk of being, uh, you know, seen by other people with their own eyes. So that's, I think, the, the reason why we're getting so nervous about cyber, because we know that, yeah, these people can do it, and, and we might never actually detect where they even reside. So that's uh, an example there. Then um, where Internet of Things, the IoT uh, world, gets affected by cyber attacks. So this is where we see any real uh, large or small device these things hangs off the Internet. Um, I'm actually not that much in favor of that if it's really not necessary. Um, I think sometimes we we uh, see organizations go the the trends. Oh, we need to have this cloud based and keeping it offline uh, in um, control rooms, uh, for example, to have actually um, supported local not connected to uh, can be underwise. Yeah, so that's uh, uh, for safety reasons and for not being subject to the microphone. Sounds very old fashioned, but for the crew, I think it's something uh, So, and yet, yeah, that, that meets uh, product. Uh, we now do know what has been put in that uh, supply chain could be even uh, bad chemicals things like that if you drive of a country well if you think about that being a target we get really nervous about these kinds of uh, uh, situations and some ways that actually like they for example they be in cybersecurity but still yeah for completely watertight airtight all of those so um, hopefully these these stories don't shock you too much, but the fact that your uh, um, all your innovation and your digital transformation and all these things have wonderful impacts on your productivity, perhaps on your innovation uh, with your customers and so on and your products. But uh, think about the flip side, and that is that yeah, the the, the invisible kind of risk that is that is out there sometimes. So it has to be a, a, a good balancing act. And you can see here what uh, what happened with that uh, that issue. Um, what I wanted to touch on here is um, we often hear governments and also corporates and and, uh, and and government agencies actually declaring that they would not pay ransom, but when it really comes to the moment when they're being hacked uh, and and their data are out there or the the hackers are threatening to put their data out there in the uh, in public domain, um, you sometimes see their uh, their choice changes. You know the, the the affected organization's choice changes, and they suddenly do decide to uh, pay ransom. Uh, we also see a number of examples where there's class action uh, against organizations who didn't pay ransom, and then customer data went out there in the public domain. There's there's at least two or three examples of this in the last year in the region where I live in uh, in Australia. And so, yeah, it's it's a very interesting field uh, when you talk about cybersecurity uh, or as for cyber insurance, for example. Um, with cyber insurance, uh, there is actually uh, most of the time there's clauses in there that allow you to pay ransom, and the insurer will actually cover that. And hackers tend to know these days what that cover is that you have, and they will ask for ransom just under that level. And so we're dealing with a number of challenges here. Uh, there's also a number of organizations that tell me that uh, they're now pooling their funds and not actually getting insurance for uh, for cyber attacks. They're actually pooling their money together with other organizations in the same industry or uh, people that they uh, that they liaise with, partnerships. And uh, yeah, because it's becoming too expensive to have cyber insurance. So these are becoming quite strategic questions. And that's where we're heading now with that whole story. It's about trying to get buy-in and support from the senior leadership when they see the actual impacts on the bottom line, on the day-to-day -day costing of a business and the opportunities that, uh, that are coming with it. That's where you can possibly get some traction. So the cost of a breach over time, uh, here's the, the development of that. And you can see here over the last, uh, let's say uh, 36, uh, to 48 months, you can 
see that that's gone dramatically up. Yeah, the, that's uh, that's where we see the the cost over time, not the immediate impact of a cyber attack, but actually, uh, if then customers leave at the end of the year and they switch suppliers or something, you can see that the overtime costing needs to be calculated, and that's uh, become a pretty dramatic uh, development as you can see here, and especially in highly regulated industries. So what I wanted to ask you guys all in the chat, um, can you please put in there, what is the biggest biggest cyber rock in your shoe? Now, what I mean with that is on your road, on your uh, in your shoe, what is the biggest rock in terms of your cybersecurity preparedness? Or you can even answer it more broadly with information security as a reference point. So basically, what is the biggest challenge that you are dealing with in your role as a, a beginning cybersecurity uh, specialist, or you might be a very experienced cyber risk uh, con consultant, or you might be in an organization dealing with uh, risk management around cyber. Uh, whatever your role is, can you please type in the chat right now, what is your biggest, biggest challenge? Yeah, so please fire away. I can see here some answers coming through. Management support. People think that they will not be affected. Yeah, people think that, oh, it will happen to someone else. Maybe someone else. I can see if they're coming through in the typing, uh, typing there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very interesting. User awareness issue, internal threat, insider threat is uh, also a very interesting field, and this is where boards and executives could really switch on because um, insider threat is not just someone uh, necessarily turning into a rotten apple. You know, we always think, oh. If you work here for a period of time, you're part of the, I don't know, the company, the family, whatever you're going to call it. Um, and how can someone suddenly do bad things to, you know, the company, their colleagues, etc.? It doesn't uh, typically evolve like that. Um, being coerced into uh, bad behavior is a fundamentally different thing. And that's what we typically now see. Uh, I know uh, quite a few experts in this field who I, I listen to a lot and um, when someone does something bad to their own employer, in many, many cases, not in all, but in many, many cases, it's not just their own suddenly, you know, turning themselves against the company. It's usually being uh, influenced, recruited, we call that, uh, by hackers, by criminals to do something bad. And if they don't, they might do something far worse, like threatening their family or have compromising information on the person, which is very easy to do when you do a little bit of research on someone online. And so typically these uh, these criminals, they find ways to make a, a very good employee who would never in their sane mind do something, turn them uh, and, and make them do things that are, are completely illegal and uh, that really compromise the information of the organization. So don't always think it's it's an uh, an intentional uh, you know uh, issue, um, and and of course there's a variety of things in between. Um, what what we also find is background checking of staff uh, sounds great, right? Like you're being reviewed, your uh, your ethical uh, values, your financial issues, you know, your family history, but often that's done once, and then you've got your access to everything, and suddenly. Two, three, four months later, you might find that actually you have a different situation. And are you actually reviewing staff at that frequency? And we typically find that that's not the case at all. So it's like really we think, oh, we hire someone. And if it's a good person, they will never do anything. And that's what I'm trying to say. It's a very uh, versatile, you know, it's a, it's a very changing field. And yeah, you need to, of course, keep on checking that then. And to what degree can you do that? Or do you have any other monitoring tools? So, yeah, there's quite a lot of challenges I see coming through in the chat there. Information availability, support costs, human nature being, you know, different every day, really. Um, awareness and adherence to protocols, um, and especially if you make those protocols too hard. Like, for example, password change policy. Sounds like a simple thing, right? Oh, we can just make that uh, you have to change your passwords every week, every month. And it has to be minimum eight characters with uh, exclamation marks and, and you know, special characters and numerical values and whatever. And that's all great, you know, for your technical control. But what do people do if it becomes too hard to remember those passwords because they have to change all the time and, you know, it has too many characters. They start circumvening that control. And how do they do that? Well, for example, by writing their password on a sticky note and sticking it under their keyboard. And you wonder what is a bigger risk, you know, to have a less frequent 
password change policy and have people remember it or now they're all sticking it in sticky notes and sharing it um, in that way or making their password the same on all different uh, platforms and systems and so yeah it's it's a con constant balancing act yeah but thank you for sharing in the chat that's uh, that's great to read and to see how there's a variety of issues going on there. Yeah. Uh, one of the most important ones here, and that also touches on the rest of my slides, is security is thought in isolation and not as an organizational level. So it's not embedded in typical day to day business. And so, yeah, so once again, it's important to uh, to have that also covered and somehow make a culture of, of people uh, adopting this. And that's also not easy, right? You don't just change culture overnight, but having people think the what ifs can be a starting point or having a tagline or something simple that they can think about during a period of a, maybe a whole year when that becomes a theme for the organization to uh, to get their staff more aware and not overwhelming them with 137 different risks. And people don't remember that, of course. All right, um, this picture I really like. Um, so if we're all uh, running from the bear, how fast do you then need to be? You can put that in the chat if you like. It's a, It looks like a funny picture, right? But if we're all running like these, uh, I think it's the BBC guys uh, running from it. How fast do you need to be if we are all running from that bear? So you can put, put that in the uh, chat. Hi, hi Vinsky. And so let me have a look at uh, what some of you might be answering there. Anyone have any other answers? Typically, what we think is, oh, maybe we just have to be faster than the slowest person. And then the bear, bear stays busy with that one for a while. And also what people think these days is if they are not... <laughs> I can see uh, some of those answers coming through. Um, so typically what we also see is, is uh, people have the perception that if their industry is compromised, like, you know, by a particular malware or something, if they do slightly better than the competitors, the illusion is, oh, well, that might be good enough because we'll still look better than the rest of the pack, uh, literally when we're running from that cyber bear. And uh, the answer these days, it's it's not like that anymore. Uh, customers are way too smart these days. They know that you should have good controls in place, good response plan, good preventative controls, good alternate suppliers of cybersecurity services, and so on. So it's, uh, yeah, it's basically not good enough anymore to be just faster than the slowest person. You really have to be faster than that bear. So I think uh, one person answered that immediately uh, correctly. So thank you once again. Um, the uh, it's not an IT thing anymore. I think that's important to realize these days. Well, these days as well, people still think it's ah oh, the IT department fixing the cyber issues. Um, really, what the ISO twenty seven thousand one promotes is a whole of organization end to end awareness engagement. So from the work floor, from the senior leadership, and also the continual improvement. It's not just an IT thing anymore. We're now really looking at having this particular issue managed by an organization corporate-wide, like organization-wide. So what that means is, for example, HR might be involved in having a training of staff tackled. Um, corporate comms might be involved in having, during a cyber attack, having the right uh, information pushed out to uh, staff, but also their customers and other stakeholders out there. Uh, there might be other areas like engineering or development or whatever that are also having the awareness about how this um, this issue of cybersecurity affects their area specifically and what workarounds they might have that are, for example, offline. So that you know it doesn't actually matter if um, yeah if something happens, they can at least continue the core business. So you can see here also an example of how um, the governments around the world are starting to become less understanding if a uh, board or you know particular company directors knew about a cyber risk and didn't actually articulate it didn't disclose it and didn't treat it so these these days disclosure doesn't just mean oh we now have a cyber attack happening disclosure also means that to your stakeholders you are now having to say we are at risk or if not explaining why not and so it's not uh, as easy anymore to just say, oh, we just uh, basically, uh, 
you know, we wait for it to happen and then we disclose it in 24 hours. That's also important, of course. But uh, next to that, you have to, for good corporate governance, you also have to now really make sure that you disclose things uh, on the go and actually explain to your customers and stakeholders and regulators that you're protecting your business properly. And if you don't, what are the reasons? And what is your plan to do that uh, soon enough you know, to protect your business better? And what's your investment plan around that? And how do you cover that? So, um, yeah, it's becoming really a whole of business uh, issue and not just an IT thing. So what can you do um, using the ISO standards and frameworks, but generally talking to people out there in your organization? Explain to them that a cyber incident response plan is not the same as a DR plan. Disaster recovery plans in the past used to assume one data center or server room would be unavailable, for example, by, because of flooding or fire or something. And then we would have an alternate data center, server room, set of systems to then cover for that. That was DR. Now, when we are talking about cloud, that fundamentally has changed, right? But also when we talk about cyber risk, we now find there's potentially a risk that both environments are affected, your production as well as your disaster recovery environment. And that means that, well, we need still business continuity plans, manual workarounds, all sorts of alternate ways to do business. And uh, yeah, that your DR strategy might be completely out the window because both environments, multiple environments are affected by the same malware. Also explain to business people that um, they are specifically a target as business people. And for example, CEO and CFO fraud, where uh, whaling, as we call it, the big ticket items, the big fish in your organization are specifically targeted uh, to actually, for example, be impersonated during an e business email compromise where people in the business are acting upon requests like making transfers. And these days we're getting phone calls almost every day. If you're a supplier, a vendor, you get phone calls regularly now from uh, clients who want to make a transfer to you as a supplier, but they need to uh, manually validate that with phone calls and so on. So uh, uh, the CEOs and CFOs do need to have the awareness that they, as a person, can also be a target because that becomes a still a person clicking on the wrong thing. And that would be uh, yeah, a training and, and awareness issue. The cloud seemed uh, something magical, right, uh, years ago. Oh, we can now uh, outsource our problem of security and disaster recovery. And because the cloud providers, they're much better prepared. You know, we think that they have great data centers and uh, fantastic information security and secure payment gateways and, and goodness knows what. But in my view, the cloud is just someone else's computer. Yeah, And let that sink in for a while. When you're managing your own systems, your own connectivity, your own security, at least you know when there's emerging risks, when there's suddenly, for example, not enough workforce, uh, like key staff leaving, uh, training, uh, you know, and awareness uh, getting out of uh, out of date. With your cloud vendors, you're not in their door all the time. You don't know what they're doing all the time. And they may have, you know, co uh, committed to wonderful protocols and, uh, and procedures and practices in their contracts, but my experience is um, the cloud vendors, their salespeople are happy to sign any kind of contract with a potential customer. They actually, actually sometimes put in additional um, clauses of how quickly they might respond in terms of an incident, you know, in, in a real incident. But those salespeople at your cloud or, or other vendors are typically not the same people as your actual technical experts in these cloud vendor uh, organizations or in your IT uh, vendors generally. So their own salespeople and their own technology people are typically not talking. So the salespeople promise you something in terms of response times or support. And when a real incident happens, you have to really still uh, see, is that actually uh, being achieved? Are they actually delivering that? And do you know if there's other customers knocking on the same door? And uh, are we getting priority in that in that situation? All right. The detection and assessment of a cyber threat is far more complex than assessing if a building is subject to fire or flood or something. Cyber, you know, is is uh, sometimes it takes 18 months before realizing that data has been compromised. So it's very, very difficult to then do the assessment on the source of that particular hack, of that particular data breach. And what was the the, the issue? Was it a lack of patching? Was it a, a insider threat situation? Was it 
any other things that, that we can think about, we don't know. And especially because there's such a time lag. So it's often complex and we typically need external support to assess the uh, the problem. And that's again, subject to some, sometimes a lot of waiting times, especially if those specialists are busy with helping others as well. In-house expertise often being insufficient, that links with that. And I've already mentioned this one. Um, yeah, the SLAs don't really cut it. Sometimes your service level agreements are sometimes going straight out the window in these situations. And you still have to answer your customers, of course, if they're uh, concerned about that issue. And pointing the finger at the supplier is not really uh, an option anymore. Insurers may actually encourage you to pay ransom. And that's where things get really strange. I mean, which insurer would uh, tell you, uh, give the, the burglar all your furniture and, you know, uh, help them along? Uh, when we see uh, insurers doing this, there's there's really an interesting uh, development going on. Uh, their premiums are getting higher and higher, though. There's, so maybe there's a linkage there. I'm not uh, pointing fingers, but um, it's a it's a very strange situation. And the other thing is, it's absolutely reasonable as a business person, as a business manager, to demand technical experts to avoid bedazzling lingo. So if you're one of those technicians that actually uses an acronym every second word. Uh, it's your responsibility to translate those acronyms into normal business language. It's also reasonable for business people to uh, expect you to translate their world into yours. Like, for example, what is important to a business person? Financial impact, physical security, you know, compliance, reputation, those things that they can understand if you're a technical cyber expert. So you need to learn to translate all of that. And that's a big job. So it's not in the knowledge you have, it's in the questions you ask. And that's also for the boards and executives to know. Maybe they don't understand any of these bedazz bedazzling concepts around cyber and the technical uh, talk around it, but uh, they need to learn to ask the right questions. And that's for, especially for the business uh, managers out there. Common pitfalls in cybersecurity. It's uh, all in people's heads uh, or there's extensive documents, but still gaps. Uh, a lot of people copying and pasting procedures and plans off the internet, uh, chat GPT, you know, like, oh, we just yeah, fix a few things and there we've got our plan. Uh, yeah, that's that's not an option if you have a specific industry requirement, if your organization is a little bit different from the stock standard, your workforce is different, your education levels or awareness sessions uh, have already taken place, for example, you can then maybe uh, assume some different preparedness levels. So all that stuff uh, that is coming off, off the shelf, it still needs a lot of modification and, and tweaking. You also might find that there's no ownership or rhythm uh, to update, and especially those cybersecurity pr uh, procedures. Not properly translating things into business benefits, uh, and required budgets seeming unlimited. It's like uh, the executive or the board see another cyber guy coming in the door asking for more budget for more technical controls or some mysterious thing that the board doesn't understand anyway. Uh, that's a, a, a real syndrome that I see happening everywhere. Skills shortages, and that's uh, needing uh, with staff suitably assessed, uh, assessment criteria and methods. This is really difficult area. And we see skill, uh, skill shortages in, in all industries uh, to, to a high degree these days, but especially in cybersecurity, information security skills, that's even harder to find good people. Um, I heard the other day that in my country, in Australia, where we have 23 million people, uh, apparently there are 30,000 uh, new cybersecurity experts required uh, to be uh, employed in our country in the next two to three years. Where do you find those, you know? And um, often we also find it's done without engagement of physical security and business managers. So cybersecurity people have a, usually a bit of an isolated position out there uh, under IT or, you know, in a special area and uh, or with, you know, sometimes with privacy or areas like that or risk management. But, um, yeah, we, we typically don't find enough interaction with other disciplines like physical security management and uh, other business areas. But over focus on technical controls I mentioned already and little commitment to test the cyber incident response plan with surprise challenges. For example, key people not being uncontacted, not being available. Multiple related impacts occurring at the same time. So there may be a physical attack as well as a cyber attack at the same time. And, and uh, protesters and uh, their hackers, they're often working together on physical as well as cyber attacks at the same time. So we typically don't test all of that and we don't simulate that. 
Um, and lastly, multiple unrelated impacts occurring at the same time, like Murphy's law and Smith's law, we say it. Uh, so unrelated impacts can be, ah, it's a bad day because, you know, it's actually payday today. And now we've got this compromise of our data happening and it's uh, related to our, our employee information. So that would be Murphy's law. Smith's law apparently said Murphy was an optimist. So it's kind of taking it to the next level of unpreparedness and maybe three incidents happening at the same time that have nothing to do with each other, but just accidentally happening on that day. And uh, as a result, false sense of security and lack of actional readiness. So that's our, uh, our uh, end of our list here. Now, cyber risk mitigation, therefore, it needs to cover people, process, and technology, not just technology. And especially when it comes to processes like steps and documents and checklists and testing those, it needs to be kind of quick reference guide related. And we often find people already making things like uh, playbooks, uh, you know, and, and and short lists and checklists. But um, yeah, then the people putting that to the test. And we see here, uh, what teams do you need? What training and awareness? Red teaming as a role, whole initiative. That's where we use our internal staff, uh, for example, to hack their own process, to crack their own process, where we see what's the most vulnerable time of the day or month or year or the way that uh, hackers could get into our systems. Typically, that knowledge you already have in your business. You know, um, I spoke to someone the other day. They said, oh, uh, if someone wants to get through our, uh, recruitment platform uh, with unverified documents and, or diplomas there and not not sort of not sort of, not proper certification uh, as a as a person the best day to do that is on friday because that's when we only have our junior hr and uh, it staff working on that particular process and on the other days of the week there's also the senior leadership who or you know the senior hr person who always checks everything any new applicants but if it's on a friday that's probably the easiest for someone to sneak through that process. And so the internal staff are utilized with, with red teaming to identify real vulnerabilities. Very interesting uh, way to test. Now, technology, I mentioned, is typically the first thing we think about. Um, but we're, we're in this uh, space of IoT, I mentioned, and also IT hardware generally. They also need protection. So that's where you can get some really nice initiatives happening with physical and cybersecurity people working together. When it's about IoT, when it's about IT hardware being protected in terms of uh, the controls around it, cyber controls, the information security uh, controls. So yeah, it's a nice uh, world that uh, that you can start merging because it's needed. You know, We all need to work together with others that think the what ifs. These are some examples of uh, requirements. Uh, the ISO 27001 is in there, but there's other ones that we typically need to deal with. PCI, the payment card industry, uh, uh, the AI, AI CPA, the SOC 2 or SOC, maybe you know that particular framework as well. And you can see some other frameworks there. Right, so let's have a look now at the ISO 27001 and how that can help with all these things I've been sharing just now. Let me have a quick look in the chat if there's uh, a couple of questions there. Yeah. Um, I might just cover that now because we actually talked about the, these aspects in the previous slide. We can see here, risk assessment needs to be done uh, department-wise or company as a whole. Risk assessment can be a um, hybrid kind of approach where you have some generic risks. You might have some HR risks, for example, with particular controls that affect the whole organization. Uh, certain IT controls, certain security controls, workplace health and safety controls, they might all be uh, generic for the whole organization or some departments or particular region where your, your business operates. But then there's also specific ones. So I like not giving in a silo approach all the different sites or departments their own uh, risk assessment to do because there'll be a lot of duplication and misinterpretation between different uh, business units I find. So I would probably recommend having what are the generic ones, having that really clear and having then the specific ones as little pillars underneath and making them uh, done by all those different business units that have specific uh, risks to them, but also different impact ratings and likelihood ratings. Hopefully that uh, answers that question. 
Um, we're talking about um, the ISMS. Do we need to address product security or just back office support security? Uh, in the ISMS, it's actually everything, especially the ISO 27001 talks about everything. Um, there is a variation of the 27001 called the 28000, and that is our information security in the supply chain. So it's actually like in the, in the ISO 27000 family, there are some sub standards or frameworks or guidelines and that particular one is also certifiable uh, as far as I remember uh, the uh, information security in the supply chain so how do you actually check on systems of your suppliers I might have to double check that because there's not or not all the ISO standards are certifiable uh, by organizations most you can certify as a person and do an exam in it but uh, I'm talking about company certification here and then the last question here that I'm uh, seeing is, can penetration testing be done by in-house uh, uh, department or does it have to be done through an external third party? Typically, I see external uh, third parties being hired for this because the emerging risk, the constant change, it tends to become uh, relatively stale and also difficult for in-house staff to always be at the forefront of what's happening in the industry when it comes to cyber risk. So if you have the the, the opportunity, it's uh, probably at least regularly also get external uh, support with it. Yeah, because it's such a, a changing field. Okay, so... Here you can see the ISO 27001 2022 main clauses. This is the, the year, the, the, the two years ago version that came out of the, the standard. And you can see the general clauses. And let's have a look at which ones are related to people, to processes, to what actually might help you get engagement and awareness of staff. And we mentioned buy-in and support of, of executives as well. So I would probably say all of these have a direct link with people, with organizational uh, departments, with um, communicating the benefits across the board. All of these, these have a relevance have relevance to that. Especially down there at the bottom, you can see awareness, competency, resource, but that's all linked to, to that. And also 5.1, leadership and commitment. So all of these clauses have a link with our uh, how to get buy-in from the organization. Then the next list, I would say all of them as well. So that is where we see uh, controls like internal audits, uh, management reviews. That's all linked to your senior leadership. And you can see all of these other ones have some sort of linkage as well. Then the actual annex. Now, the annex to the ISA 27001 is the actual controls. They are now grouped in four segments. This is different from the previous version of this standard, which was in 2013. That was a different list, but now we have four groupings. The, the first one being organizational controls. Once again, they're all linked to how your staff, your management, you know, people who work with these frameworks, their the processes and procedures, how they're all linked to um, to that. So here you can see uh, also the difference with the previous version uh, of that standard. And then another list, and this one is continuing from the organizational controls. You can see a number of them, like information security in the supply chain, and all those concepts we talked about, business continuity, all of these have a linkage with your strategic and tactical levels of the organization and how to sell the message out to them. Then the people controls. Well, that's clearly also a list that is relevant to all people, including senior leadership, but also uh, yeah, the general workforce, like things like teleworking, or we call it remote work now. Uh, disciplinary processes, you know, they of course have a direct linkage there. And physical controls. I would say all of these, any staff, any manager, any senior leadership team member who set foot into your premises with their devices, who use their devices in different places, storage media and so on, there's again a opportunity to, even with these physical controls, to use that as a um, selling point for ISMS to your senior leadership and your general workforce. So where you find opportunities here, it's actual stories especially. So if I'm trying to sell the concept of information security to the broader workforce, I'm trying to find real examples and case studies of where any of these have gone wrong. You know, for example, was there an actual uh, breach because there was no clear desk and clear screen policy applied to an organization? Uh, working in secure areas, do people actually activate the right controls? We can find actual case studies around that. All right. Um, then 
the last list and um, you can see here uh, a question there from um, uh, I think okay, so the, the last question on the list here in our Q&A provides some list of controls that could be considered apart from these 93. Um, we actually use this as a framework, uh, the clauses and the controls, which we still haven't finished, by the way, we're still not there. Uh, these are the technological ones. And with this list together, I think you're probably uh, looking at a pretty good scope of, of controls that you need to think about. So you can see here all these uh, technical controls, and some of them are actually uh, related also to what you can use to sell it to the broader workforce. These are some uh, things that people can digest, data leakage prevention, things like access rights. Of course, that links very much to their own behaviors as a uh, as a staff member. And uh, the question in the chat is there, how to transition from 2013 to 22. Uh, you can see here how in, in my organization, my uh, consultancy firm, we have put a column there to show what is the uh, corresponding clause or control from the old version now in the, in the new one. Yeah, so the references compared to the old version. So hopefully that gives you an idea there. You can do this yourself as well, but it's a lot, a lot of work uh, to cross check them. But what you can do is put the 2013 and the 22 and only look at where there's real uh, new items, new concepts, real discrepancies between the two. Because most clauses were in the 2013, slightly different wording, but uh, yeah, it's it's typically not that much new. There's a few things around um, investigations. There's a few things around cloud security that are new. Um, uh, the question about capacity management in the chat there. Uh, capacity management talks more about the capacity of your IT environment. So your server capacity, for example, your VPN uh, licensing capacity, how many of your users or how many of your applications can use a particular piece of hardware or a uh, an application in in, this, in case of uh, uh, you know number of users. So it talks about uh, managing that capacity because that can create if it's getting very close to the um, if the usage is very close to the capacity of a server, for example, or a network uh, link, you can then get unavailability issues like. I mentioned the CIA, you know, the um, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So that's where you can talk about the availability issue. All right. Um, I will continue a little bit more here. You can see some other examples. Uh, we might just see some of the, the chat questions uh, at the end in the Q&A. That will be very soon. In about uh, two or three minutes, I'll wrap up. So um, these are the, lab, the, the the later sort of controls here on that list of technical controls, privileged utility programs. I think that usually resonates with the workforce as well. They can understand that it's their choice or their approval that needs to be done for that. And sometimes that doesn't happen for the right reasons because it can be, of course, risky. And outsource development. That's where we have relationships with external vendors. So what's the role of business managers and executives? Um, in my view, it is really about um, smart definition of risk appetite. That's one of the key things that business managements, managers and executives need to do. And it's very blurry often. You know, the, the risk appetite statements I see out there, they're utopian, they're vague, they're not translatable to general workforce. So that's a key role of business managers in this field. Um, and uh, the managers should also demand to the point progress updates during an actual incident. So that's where we see some uh, coherence between the technology people, security people, and the, the leadership. For example, if a real incident is evolving, what you don't want is that your technical staff uh, and your information security staff are running into the boardroom uh, or sitting there you know, and constantly uh, give updates or get up technical kind of updates to people. But uh, what we typically find works better is every 20 to 30 minutes have new facts, new impacts, and new recommendations coming out of those technical people to the border executive and yeah, the, the leadership team, because that's when they can keep on making decisions in between. But what we often find is, is technical uh, staff as soon as they uh, get into that boardroom, into that uh, crisis management team uh, meeting room, um, this, the, the, the leaders are starting to ask detailed questions about something that they don't really know anything about. And they will never understand so quickly anyway. But we often find that the constant flow of more information and more details and more impacts and technical talk and more jargon. And actually what in that incident should happen is that that management team should be focused on making the right decisions 
to have clear gaps, time lapses in the sense of not being constantly overwhelmed with new detail. So we really would like to see more like every 20 to 30 minutes, maybe 10 minutes, whatever works, but it needs to be that there's a time in between where they can have conversations and think about the, the broader business impacts. So again, facts, impacts, and recommendations. Silver lining of an incident. Very important to realize if things go wrong, of course, there's always a benefit there. And you can see here an organization that had uh, ransomware and they, instead of giving in, they rebuilt built anything, so everything. So they actually didn't pay ransom, they just rebuilt and they said it was a great exercise and now they're far better prepared to, uh, to be withstanding those uh, impacts. And you can see here similar sort of things where in a real uh, attack, there was flaws and now they're doing uh, regular exercising. So sometimes you need that awareness. Other business benefits of cybersecurity uh, incidents, and, and even if an attack never happens, you can see some benefits, especially cheaper cyber insurance. That may be one of your key things there. The biggest benefit, if you ask me, uh, and that's this is another uh, final question for the chat, uh, the, the biggest benefit, let's talk about when you um, uh, think about the analogy of driving a car, uh, why does your car have brakes? Very simple question. Please put your answer in the chat. Why does your car have brakes? Why is that important? When you're driving the car, why does it need brakes? Please fire away. Put something in the chat there. Prevent. Slow down. Be in control of the risks. To manage. To control. You know, nothing is really wrong with it, with any of your answers. Uh, safety, you know, I could see here. Um Rethinking your action. Um, all of this is true, but if I walk into an executive leadership team uh, meeting and I say, I am here to help control the bad stuff, I've already lost them, basically. Yeah, so my answer when it's about why does the car have brakes, which I ask also of these leaders, I ask them the same question. Uh, my answer of why does the car have brakes is so you can drive faster. Now have a think about that. How slow would you have to drive if you didn't have brakes? And that's the answer I give to executives who think that security and risk people, they're here to block the progress and they don't allow for innovation. They're basically just a pain in the backside. Um, my language around it is not to avoid incidents and accidents and, and, and slow down. My language is around um, I'm helping you achieve your corporate objectives. And that's a far better question to start the conversation with. First, ask your leadership, ask them, what is one of your strategic objectives? And let them write that on a sticky note and then ask them three bullet points that could derail that objective, that could get that off track. So those bullet points, they are really your risks, right? And that could derail their objectives. And so if you, if you start with that conversation, with the strategic objectives as a starting point, that's when you can possibly get some more traction. So start with that because that's what they like to talk about, not so much risks. They don't like to talk about that. All right. Um, let's continue on. Uh, so how to talk security at board and security in C-suite level. These are the three concepts I would really milk, the things that I really emphasize. What is the rock on their road? Don't think about just the rock on your road as a security person. You want more budget, you want to get more traction, but what is the rock on their road? Financial impact and related pro uh, probabilities, for example, in percentages, um, reputational impact, governance and, and compliance. That's the concept, that's the real things that uh, bother the board and the C-suite. And these are some of the, the ways that you can then sell that in their terminology to them. For example, if you say, we've got this really bad security risk, oh, it's huge impact, huge likelihood. What does that mean? Well, maybe you want to translate it differently and say, it's got this percentage of likelihood or some range, maybe five to 10%, you know, you don't have to be that specific, but give it some sort of, uh, numerical value and in that case what does it cost us oh it could cost us uh, on average would probably cost us a hundred million dollars or something or you know 
uh, 20 pesos or whatever. It might be the thing that the thief wants to hear about is reputation. And again, ah, what does it mean? Based on a recent case, towers will incur a loss of 20% market fund, finance, uh, governance and compliance. He held liable personally for that if they were aware of it. Plus, we will lose our license to operate. That's the kind of wording that you need to use for them to really realize what they're dealing with and how they can then see the importance of what's, what's uh, being proposed to them. The broader workforce, and then I'll, um, I think I will need to uh, we start it a little bit later, but I'll finish up then so for some questions. And there's also a game happening, I hear. Um, the broader workforce, just as important because that's where risk resides. And especially also for uh, practical treatment and uh, options and controls. Then a few ideas on that. The what's in it for me, make sure you tackle that for the broader workforce and keeping it simple with a with a tagline or the top three risks or something simple that they can retain for the coming period. And of course, uh, hot topics in the news, case studies, and give them some rewards as well. Uh, competitions, you know, the fun factor. These things can all be used for uh, engaging the broader workforce. All right, these last uh, slides summarize all the things I've mentioned. Uh, that's the end of my uh, of my talk. This is really about all the, the wrapping up of uh, knowing that you can use a picture instead of a thousand words, you know, looking at the security champions at top management level, engaging them first, thinking about facts and impacts and recommendations, yeah, and looking at what then when with those recommendations, not during an incident, but in day-to-day in, in -day business, what are then the costs and the value adds of implementing controls? And lastly, this, uh, this slide here, uh, for you to position yourself as a uh, business enabler yeah, and, and translating concepts around security as a bridge, basically, to the business world. If you don't have a CISO, people always complain to me, they go, oh, we don't have a chief security officer, the, the board and the executive don't find it important enough that we're all doing this at the lower levels. We don't have the visibility at the C level. Well, at least start building a united front you know, with business continuity, risk officers, physical security, and all these, the what if people, the, the, the doomsday people, I call them, uh, have the convergence approach at least. Think about a think tank type approach together with them and do that. Even if you can't get the visibility at the board, in this way you can get some further visibility maybe by some people in these areas uh, that I've listed here that are at sea level. 